While the Pilgrims were the early arrivers to America and their deeds and experiences make outstanding folklore, they really weren't the country's founders. This country was formally settled 19 years before the Pilgrims' arrival, when land from the Atlantic to the Mississippi had been staked out by what was then the world's largest transnational corporations. In fact, a corporation. In fact, the Pilgrims arrived in America in 1620 aboard a boat they chartered from that corporation. That boat, the Mayflower, had already made three trips to North America from England on behalf of the East India Company, the corporation that owned it. Much of this transportation was provided at a profitable price by the East India Company, which laid claim to parts of North America and created the first official colony on this continent on company-owned land, deeded to the Virginia Company in 1606. The Virginia Company was named after the Virgin Queen, Elizabeth, who was the founder of the East India Company. And uh, the company the, called the town Jamestown after the company patron and major stockholder King James I, who took the throne and the royal share of the company's stock when Queen Elizabeth died in 1603. The company placed Jamestown on the Chesapeake Bay in the company-owned Commonwealth of Virginia, as I mentioned, named after the Virgin Queen. Among the company's biggest and most vexing problems were America's colonial small businessmen, our entrepreneurs, who ran their own small, small ships to bring tea and other goods directly into America without routing them through Britain or through the East India Company. And there were many small business tea retailers in North America who were buying their wholesale tea directly from Dutch trading companies instead of the East India Company. These two types of competition were really painful for the company. So what did the East India Company do? They set a precedent that multinational corporations follow to this day. They lobbied for laws before the British Parliament that would enable the company to easily put their small business competitors out of business. As trade to the American colonies grew, and under pressure from the East India Company, the British government passed a series of laws that increased the company's power, the corporation's power and influence, and reduced its competition and its barriers to international trade, including the Townsend Acts of 1767 and the Tea Act of 1773. The Tea Act was the most essential for the East India Company because the American colonies had become a huge market for tea, millions of pounds per month, which was largely being supplied at cheap prices by Dutch trading companies and American smugglers, also known as privateers, because they operated privately instead of working for the British East India Company. The company also encouraged the British government to prosecute these entrepreneurial traders and smugglers as pirates under a 1681 law. Many people today think that the Tea Act... 1773, which led to the Boston Tea Party, directly to it, was simply an increase in taxes on tea paid by American colonists. They're wrong. Instead, the purpose of the Tea Act was to give the East India Company full and unlimited access to the American tea trade and to exempt that corporation from having to pay taxes to Britain on tea exported to the American colonies. It even gave the company a tax refund on millions of pounds of tea that it was unable to sell and was holding in inventory. One purpose of the Tea Act of 1773 was to increase the profitability of the East India Company so its stockholders, which included the king, and, uh, and help the company drive its colonial small business competitors out of business. Because the company temporarily no longer had to pay taxes to England, and they held a monopoly on the tea it sold to the American colonies, they were able to drop their tea prices to undercut those of the local importers and the mom-and-pop tea merchants and tea houses up and down the East Coast in every town in America. This infuriated the independence-minded colonists, who were, by and large, unappreciative of their colonies being used as a profit center for the multinational East India Corporation. They resented their small businesses still having to pay the higher pre-Tea Act taxes without having any say or vote in the matter. Thus the cry, no taxation without representation. This economics-driven view of American history so piqued my curiosity when I first discovered it that when I came upon an original first edition of one of this nation's earliest history books, I made a sizable investment to buy it to read the thoughts of somebody who'd actually been alive and participated in the Boston Tea Party. I bought a copy from an antiquarian bookseller of the uh, retrospect of the Boston Tea Party and with a memoir by R. George R.T. Hughes, a survivor of the little band of patriots who drowned the tea in Boston Harbor in 1773. Yes, that was the title, published in New York by S.S. Bliss. 
turning its brittle age-colored pages and looking at printing on unevenly sized sheets typeset by hand and printed on a small hand press almost 200 years ago was fascinating and exciting. Reading Hughes's account, I learned that the Boston Tea Party resembled in many ways the modern, growing, modern-day protests against transnational corporations and small-town efforts to protect themselves from chain store retailers or factory farms. With few exceptions, the Tea Party's participants thought of themselves as protesters against the actions of a multinational corporation, the East India Company, and the government that unfairly represented, supported, and served that company while not representing or serving the residents of this continent. Hughes said that many American colonists either boycotted the purchase of tea or were smuggling tea or purchasing smuggled tea in order to avoid supporting the East India Company's profits and the British taxes on tea. Uh, here's, here's what he said. This is his words. He said, they rendered the smuggling of tea an object and was frequently practiced, and the resolutions against using it, this is the colonists, although observed by many with little fidelity, had greatly diminished the importation into the colonies of this commodity from the corporation. Meanwhile, an immense quantity of it was accumulated in the warehouses of the East India Company in England. The company petitioned the king to suppress the duty of three pence per pound upon the introduction into America. End of quote. That petition was successful and produced the Tea Act of 1773, a tax cut for the British East India Company. The result was a boon for them. The biggest problem that they had was the American entrepreneurs that they called smugglers. According to Hughes, the East India Company, this is a quote from him, the East Company, however, received permission to transport tea free of all duty from Great Britain to America, allowing it to wipe out its small competitors and take over the tea business in all of North America. Hence, he wrote, it was no longer the small vessels of private merchants who went to vend tea for their own account in the ports of the colonies, but on the contrary, ships of an enormous burthen that transported immense quantities of this commodity, which by the, end, by, by the aid of the public authority might, as they supposed, easily be landed and amassed in suitable magazines. Accordingly, he wrote, the company set its, sent its agents at Boston, New York, and Philadelphia 600 chests of tea and a proportionate number to Charleston and other maritime cities of the American continent. The colonies, he wrote, were now arrived at the decisive moment when they must cast the die and determine their course. Resistance was organizing and growing. The Tea Act was the final straw. The citizens of the colonies were preparing to throw off one of the corporations that for almost 200 years had determined nearly every aspect of the lives in North America through its economic and political power. They were planning to destroy the goods of the world's largest multinational corporation, intimidate its employees, and face down the guns of the government that supported it. A newsletter called The Alarm circulated throughout the colonies on May 27th, 1773, signed by Rusticus. It made clear the feelings of colonial Americans about England's largest transnational corporation and their behavior around the world. This is what Rusticus wrote. This was nailed on doors and trees all over Boston. Are we in like manner to be given up to the disposal of the East India Company, who now have the assurance to step forth in aid of the minister to execute his plan of enslaving America? Their conduct in Asia for some years past has given simple proof how little they regard the laws of nations, the rights, the liberties, or lives of men. They have levied war, excited rebellions, dethroned lawful princes, and sacrificed millions for the sake of profit. The revenues of mighty kingdoms have centered in their coffers, and these not being sufficient to glut their avarice, they have by the most unparalleled barbarities, extortions, and monopolies stripped the miserable inhabitants of their property and reduced whole provinces to indigence and ruin. 1,500,000, it is said, perished by famine in one year, not because the earth denied its fruits, but because this corporation and their servants engulfed all the necessities of life and set them at so high a price that the poor could not purchase them. End of quote. After turning back the company's ships in Philadelphia and New York, Hughes, George Robert Twelvetree Hughes, the only survivor of the of the Boston Tea Party, who actually wrote the story of what happened, wrote in his this little book of his that I have a copy of. In fact, we're showing a picture of it on the screen. He wrote, in Boston, the general voice declared the time was come to face the storm. Rusticus added his voice 
in a 1773 pamphlet saying, Resolved, therefore, nobly resolve, and publish to the world your resolutions, that no man will receive the tea. No man will let his stores or suffer the vessel that brings it to moor at his wharf. And that if any person assists at unloading, landing, or storing it, he shall ever be deemed an enemy to his country and never be employed by his fellow citizens. People were getting upset. Colonial voices were getting louder and louder about their outrage at this giant corporation's behavior. Another issue, the alarm signed uh, in dated October 27, 1773 said, it hath now been proved to you that the East India Company obtained the monopoly of that trade of tea by bribery and corruption, that the power thus obtained they have prostituted to extortion and other the most cruel and horrible purposes the sun ever beheld. And then, says Hughes, on a cold November evening, the first of the East India Company's ships of reduced tax tea arrived in Boston Harbor. On the 28th of November, 1773, the ship Dartmouth with 112 chests arrived, and the next morning after, the following notice was widely circulated. Friends, brethren, country, the worst of plagues, the detested tea has arrived in this harbor. The hour of destruction, a manly opposition to the machinations of tyranny, stares you in the face. Many Americans today believe that the colonists were upset. Oh, I'm sorry, that was <laughs> many Americans today believe that the colonists were upset because they didn't have a legislature that they had elected that would pass the laws under which they were taxed. Thus, taxation without representation was their rallying cry. And while that was true, Hughes points out that the thorn in their side, the pinprick that was really driving their rage, was that England was passing tax laws for the benefit of a transnational corporation, the East India Company, at the expense of the average American worker and America's small business owners. Thus, taxation without representation also meant hitting the average person in small business with taxes while letting the richest and most powerful corporation in the world off the hook for its taxes. It was government sponsorship of one corporation over all competitors, plain and simple. And here now today, we have ExxonMobil, the most profitable corporation in the history of the world, paying no income tax in the United States. General Electric, huge profit, no income tax in the United States. Corporations manufacturing things offshore and keeping all their money offshore. I mean, it, it, it's... So, anyhow, I just wanted it to be on the record. I wanted you to know the true history of the Boston Tea Party.